Would you rise? Let's read today's scripture. Sorry, I don't mean to make you stand up, down, up, down, up, down. I mean, I don't have to stand, right? <laughs> All right, so here we go. Let's read today's scripture where we're going to find the miracle that we're going to talk about today. All right, it's found in Luke 22. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading the way for them. And he approached Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus responded and said, stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. That is the word of the Lord. Amen. 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 Y'all can have a seat. All right. So some of you in here right now, I want to start off with, some of you in here right now, you can't hear what the Lord's talking to you. You can't hear what the Lord is speaking to you because maybe somebody, some follower of Jesus maybe, has taken the word, used it wrongly, took it completely the wrong way, took it out of context, and has cut off some of your ear, one of your ears, maybe both of your ears, to where you just shut yourself off to hear what the Lord's saying to you. <laughs> but here, some of you are going to be Peter. Some of you are going to be this guy that cut off the ears of someone else. You're going to take something you heard, something you think is right, because something that somebody else said or taught about, and you're going to use it in the wrong way. You're going to use it completely out of context, and you're going to cut some ears off, or you already have. Maybe you're going to take something that you just don't even agree with. You're going to be listening to a message, you, don't, you hear something you don't agree with, and you stop right there. And you don't pay attention to the totality of the message to hear what's really being taught. And you take a 30-second clip out of a 30-minute message, and now you shut yourself off completely. And you only hear what you want to hear. And now you do damage with that. So, Father God, right now, I pray that you restore the ears of those in here you restore all of our ears, Father God, to hear what it is that you have to say to each one of us. Reach out just like you did to that, that servant slave that came to capture you. You reached out and restored that ear, Father. Restore our ears. Give us ears to hear what it is that you have for us. Father, make me small. Get me out of the way and only share what it is that you want to share, Father. You have it all. This is your message, not mine, Father God. I thank you for all that you do. We give you all the glory and all of it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, for those of you who don't know, my name's Mike. And if we haven't met, I'll be right up here after service. So please come up here. I'd love to talk with you. All right, God is so good, right? He is so, so good. And his word is perfect. It's alive. And all of it can be used for teaching. Timothy, 2 Timothy 3 says, all scripture is inspired by God, beneficial for teaching, for rebuke, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man or woman of God may be fully capable, equipped for every good work. So how is it that we can get this messed up? How is it that we can take the word of God and we can use it in a wrong way to hurt somebody, to make someone stumble, to make somebody fall? Could it be because we think we hear from God, but truly what we're hearing is our own wants, our own desires, our own thoughts of what we want to do? And we're not truly in tune with what the Holy Spirit's saying. What I mean is, do we take the scriptures and then use them for what we want? Instead of listening to what the scripture is actually talking to us. Maybe it's because we don't get into his word at all. We just said his word is alive, his word is perfect. But some of us don't even spend time in his word. Can I tell you, when the Lord works on me in a message and I prepare a message, he's working on me more than you sometimes. Can I, get, can I tell you that? So if you want to take a 30-second clip and say, this is for me more than you guys sometimes, most of the time. Amen? So sometimes we don't even spend time with the Lord. We don't even get up to spend time in prayer. You see, the most important thing you can do is spend time with the Lord. And how do we do that? 
We do it through prayer. We do it through reading the word. We do it by a personal encounter that we have with him daily. And we give those personal encounters away to other people to show the love of Christ. They're going to know us by our love. Amen? If I encourage you, if you have troubles with reading, especially if you try and do it on your phone, on your phone or on the app, <laughs> you get notifications like crazy. You get dings that come up and they, then you're off to Facebook, right? And you're off to all these other things. Pick up the word of God and read. Dig into it and read. But what do you mean we take the scriptures and we use them for whatever we want? Let me give you an example. It's an example that I love to use uh, because I hear it a lot. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Paul says this, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourself, it is the gift of God. Not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It's a great verse, right? Let's look at James 2. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? So on the surface, you can look at these verses, and I've only shared two verses out of those little section there, right? You can look at that and say, that kind of contradicts each other, right? One saying, I don't have to have any works. One says that it is works. It's, you're just not doing any studying or looking at the full context of a verse. Like I said, right, we can take things out of context. So one of us may take Ephesians and we may say, see, there's nothing I have to do. It's all faith. It's all grace. There's no works. There's nothing I have to do from this point forward. I've given my life to Christ and that's it. I don't have to do anything else. These people are dangerous, this is dangerous. That's a license to sin. You go about and you pull out of your back pocket this grace card, right? And you just go and you're like, ah, it's okay. The Lord's going to forgive me. I can do what I want to do. The Lord forgives me. I've got grace. I've got faith and I'm good to go. That's dangerous, right? You don't want to give. You don't want to give up your time, talents, or treasures. You don't want to serve. You don't want to get into a small group. You don't want to do any of this stuff. It's, I'm good. I'm saved. You come in on Sunday, you get, you get this experience, and you go out Monday through Saturday, and you live your life in the world. This is a hard message to preach, all right? I told you I preached to myself more. Right? We come in, and we have grace, and it's, it's all good. Everything's good. And then some people may take James, and they're like, uh-uh, you got to have works. i got to have my works in order for this. i got to have my works not just faith, i got to have the works in order to do this stuff. That's mind-numbing. That's a mind-numbing theology-based, works-based theology. I don't know how you can ever live up. You can't. You cannot live up to that law. You will never be good enough. In your mind, you're just going to be, I'm never good enough. I've messed up. I didn't read today. Oh, my goodness, the Lord doesn't love me anymore. And instead of turning back to the cross... And repenting of it, you just continue to run away from the foot of the cross. Because I gotta have all these works. I gotta do all this stuff. I gotta clean myself up. I'm not good enough. I'm never gonna be good enough, right? That's that's mind numbing. You will never be able to live up to that. All right? These people serve, they they go to groups, they give, but they do it because it's a works-based mentality. I have to do this stuff. This is what I have to do because this is what the word says I have to do. And that's why they're doing it. Either way, either part, either one of those that you find yourself in, you've taken portions of scripture and you've completely used it the wrong way. Because you stopped reading one verse too soon on each one of those verses. Let me show you. This is all of James 2, 14 through 17 now. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith but has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed, be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Now verse 17, 
In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. This is like journey out yesterday, being out there and just praying for people. And that's all we're going to do is pray for them when they come to get something. And not having the stuff that we have available for them out there. Just saying, ah, we're going to pray for you. Have a good day. Be on your way. Right? We had a family come yesterday, and they were able to take a shower out there with the free flow unit that was out there, and they were able to do all this stuff because they heard it on the radio. Can I tell you, a month ago, I said, we probably shouldn't have this on the radio. The people that need it aren't going to hear it. God showed off. He's like, really? <laughs> this family came because they heard it on the radio. But most importantly, I want to tell you something. It's not because, it's not to give credit to me. The family called me as I already left and went home and they said, hey, do you have any money for fuel? I could really use some fuel. Do you know inside of me I was home and I was like, I can just pray for you to get some fuel. That's not gonna help. I have gift cards I can give you. Let me come back and give them to you. Right, I heard this story one time about salvation costs nothing but discipleship can cost you everything. What that means is if you want to disciple somebody or you're being discipled yourself, it could cost you everything to do that. And that's what we're called to do, amen? So here's Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, which goes along with it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. Here's verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. Those works are the serving. Those works are the giving. Those works are going to small groups. Those works are worshiping the king of kings with all your heart, with all your soul and all your mind. Those are the works that it's about. But let me tell you, this is what I tell somebody when I talk about works. I equate it to three ways that you can think about works and why you do things. Let's look at it in the natural. The IRS we pay taxes to because it's a law. I don't like it, but it's a law, right? We pay our cell phone bill, some of us, or whatever bill you have because you do not want to lose that service, right? Or you go out to eat. You do your hobbies, fishing, hunting, sewing, whatever that hobby may look like. You do it and you spend money on it because you love it. You truly love doing that, and it's not a hindrance to you. So why do you, why do, you do the works, right? Why is it that you serve? Why is it that you give? Why is it that you tithe? What's the purpose? Is it a law? In your mind, you think, I have to do this. This is the law. Is it because you're afraid you're going to lose your salvation if you don't do it? Or are you truly doing it because you love the King of Kings? You love the Lord of Lords and you want to give him all that you have. Amen? That's what we're called to do and that's why we do it. So you see the whole Bible works together to make up the gospel. It's not taking pieces of it to make it fit what you want. So you can miss out on important parts of scriptures if you don't read it all together. So why did I talk about all that after I just talked about Jesus healing someone's ear? That's all about love, right? I mean, Jesus reached out, lovingly healed that person's ear. It's true. If you read just that part, that's what it's about. But you miss so much if you don't look at the rest of Scripture around it. You miss so much if you don't look at the other Gospels that talks about this event. All four of the Gospels talks about this. Now, Luke's is the only one that talks about healing the ear. But all four talk about somebody cutting off the ear. You have to look at it all together. So you see the guy cut off the ear. This guy that cut the ear off of this man, he listened to Jesus talk about some stuff before this. He listened to Jesus teaching him some things before this. But he only truly, truly paid attention to what he really wanted to pay attention to, really. And you're going to see it. He only heard what it is that he wanted to hear and not truly what the message was about. Let's look at some scriptures that lead up to this. Luke 22, 24. This is under a title called, Who is the Greatest? The disciples are having an argument about who the greatest is right at this time. 
They're spending time with Jesus, and now they're having an argument about who the greatest is. <laughs> and a dispute also developed among them as to which one of them was regarded as being the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles domineer over them, and those who have authority over them are called benefactors. But it is not this way for you. Rather, the one who is the greatest among you must become like the youngest, and the leader like the servant. For who is greater, the one who reclines at the table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table, but I am among you as the one who serves? You see, someone's going to take the last two weeks, three weeks of messages on authority, and we're going to use them out of context. We're going to take 30 seconds of what Pastor Adam said of authority, and we're not going to listen to the totality, and that's servant leadership, which is what we've been talking about for the last three weeks is servant leadership. That's what it's about. That's the greatest authority, falling under the authority of Jesus and being a servant leaders to other. Amen. In verse 33, right after this, Peter says, Peter says, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. So how do we get from being servant leaders to now Peter's like, I, I'll, go, I'll go to jail, um, I'll, go to, I'll die for you, whatever the case may be. Well, in Matthew, we hear this. This is all in that same section of stuff. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. He's teaching them right now, right? Peter's not listening. But after I have raised you, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter reli replied to him, even if they all fall away because of you, even if everybody else does, I will never fall away. Even though Jesus just taught him, he didn't hear. He only heard what he wanted to hear. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you at this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same thing as well. Spoiler alert, he denies them. Right? He denies them three times. He goes on to do exactly what the Lord said, even though he's like, I'm not going to do this stuff. So Peter is ready to die for the Lord. He's ready to lay down his life, right? That's what's on his mind. And then back in Luke in verse 36, he says this to them. This is Jesus. But now whoever has a money belt is to take it along, likewise also a bag. Whoever has no sword is to sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this which is written must be fulfilled in me. And he was counted with wrongdoers. For that which refers to me has its fulfillment, they said. Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. So now he's telling them to go sell their cloak and buy a sword. And so Peter's probably like, all right. Right? They tell him we have two. And he says it's enough. So they truly believe these two swords are enough for what they need, whether it be to defend themselves, to go intact, whatever the case is, they feel like these two swords are enough for what they have. But it was all they needed to fulfill Scripture, to fulfill what was written in Isaiah 53, the suffering servant Scripture, that he was to be counted with wrongdoers. It was to show that they were armed, and that's what those swords were for. They were not for self-defense. It was to fill prophecy. But Peter did not want to hear that, right? Peter's like, all right, I'm going to die for you, and now you're telling me to sell my cloak. I'm going to pick up a sword, and here we go. We're going, right? I'm following after Jesus. Here we go. This is what we're doing. So after this, they go into the garden. Jesus is in the garden now, and he's praying to the Father, right? But he's telling the disciples, and he's telling them to stay awake. Stay awake and stay in prayer so you're not leaded into temptation, right? Stay awake, stay in prayer, so you're not leaded into temptation. They do the opposite. They do the exact opposite of what Jesus just told them to do. They fall asleep. How often do we hear the Lord telling us, hey, go do this, go do that, make sure you do this, make sure you do that, let's do this. And we're like, nah, I'm good. I got my own way, I'm gonna do my own thing. Right? 
and we don't rely on Jesus. We don't listen to what he's truly telling us. And now we get to the verse that I talked about earlier. While he was still speaking, behold, a crowd came, and the one called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading the way for them. He approached Jesus to kiss him, but Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? When those who were around him saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his right ear. But Jesus responded and said, stop, no more of this. And he touched his ear and healed him. So in these scriptures, it doesn't tell us who cut off the ear. But with what I've talked to you about before, and then what we see in John's account of what happened, John says, then Simon Peter, since he had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's slave, cut off his right ear, and the slave's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put the sword into the sheath, the cup which the Father has given me, am I not to drink it? So John tells us it's no other than Peter himself. Peter heard everything that was happening before. He didn't listen to it completely, heard what he wanted, and he went and cut off the ear. I'm telling you, he was going for the head. He just had bad aim, all right? But he cut off the ear, right? He truly was not listening. But there's something important in this that I want to kind of get talking about here. In John's account, it says that Jesus says, am I not to drink it? Am I not to drink it? You see, like I talked about, Jesus was just in the garden praying, Father, take this cup from me. I don't want to drink from this cup. But only if it's your will, take this cup from me. And now we see Jesus has come to terms with this cup. He's come to terms with it. He's saying he's accepted the cup that he has to drink from. How often do we ask the Lord, remove this cup from me. Remove this call from me. Remove whatever it is that you have for me. We don't ever accept whatever it is that he has for us. But what are those plans? What is it that he has for us? Jeremiah 29, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for prosperity, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me, find me when you search for me with all, with all of your heart. Not just a little bit of it, not just on Sunday. Not just when you come into here, but with all of your heart every day. You see, his plans are always to bring prosperity and not disaster. His plans are always for a future, for a hope. But that does not mean you're not going to have trials. That does not mean you're not going to have tribulations. And this is for somebody, whether it's this service or next, because the Lord put this on me to talk about. It is not self-harm. His plans are never self-harm. I'm going to say it again. His plans are never self-harm. That is never a cup the Lord will give you. There's a false thinking, a false teaching sometimes that's out there that the Lord's never going to give me more than I can handle. He's never going to give me more than I can handle. Can I tell you in reality... The enemy is going to give you way more than you can handle. Way more than you can handle on your own. 1 Corinthians 10 is where we can get this false thinking sometimes. No temptation has overtaken you except something common to mankind. And God is faithful, so he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. Don't stop reading there. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape also. So that you will be able to endure it. The escape is always Jesus. When you put your faith, hope, and trust into Jesus, that's the escape. You cannot do it on your own. And he... The enemy will give you way more than you can handle. Being ran over by a truck is way more than I could handle in the natural. It is only by the power of the Holy Spirit through Jesus Christ that I'm able to overcome it. That's it. 
So this is Paul writing to them, right, in 1 Corinthians. Look what Paul says in 2 Corinthians when you look at more scripture about what he's talking about. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, of our affliction which occurred in Asia, that we were burdened excessively beyond our strength, so that we despaired even life. Indeed, we had the sentence of death when in ourselves so that we would not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead who rescued us from such a great a danger of death and will rescue us, he on whom we have set our hope, and he will yet deliver us. Amen? Amen. Look what Paul talks about when he's got a thorn. Because of this extraordinary greatness of revelations for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. A messenger of Satan to torment him. That's key. To keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. <laughs> this is what he said to him. My grace is sufficient for you. For power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ may dwell in you. Therefore, I delight in weakness, in insults, in distress, in persecution, in difficulties, in behalf of Christ. For when I am weak... I am strong. He's talking about the distress and in persecutions. That's our joy. Our joy is in the Lord. It's not found in this earthly stuff that we go through. We may go through trials and tribulations and all this stuff, but when we have the right focus like I talked about last time, and our focus is always on Jesus, and we're looking for Jesus in the midst of all the chaos that's going on, we can find our joy. And we're made perfect in the weakness because we have to rely on Christ. If he never gave us, if there was never anything that we could overcome on our own, why would we rely on Christ? Why would I ever reach out or rely on Christ if I could do everything in my own ability? Right? If I could do any, everything in my own ability, there's no reason. We have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And I preach to myself just as much as everybody else. We have to be comfortable being uncomfortable, right? If we stay in our comfort zone, we're not relying on anybody else but ourselves. Amen? All right, back on topic, sorry. So Peter really didn't listen to what was going on. He didn't listen to the Lord. James tells us how we should truly listen. He says, you know this, my beloved brothers and sisters. Now everyone be quick to hear, slow to speak. That's the filter that we have to have, right? And slow to anger. For a man's anger does not bring about the righteousness of God. Peter truly thought what he was doing is what the Lord had told him. He truly thought he was doing the right thing, right? He was armed, as Jesus said, let's pick up our sword. But he missed it. He truly, truly missed it. The best part about it is, though, God still uses him, right? Even in the midst of him cutting this ear off from somebody, in the midst of him denying the Lord, he still uses him to save thousands later on because it's the works that we're called to beforehand, amen? You see, some of us in here pick up the sword, the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and we wield it out of control without any training, we just take what we hear, what we're taught. That's why I encourage you to go and study everything on your own. Don't just take what someone tells you. And we use it and we start cutting people, causing harm spiritually because we don't know how to properly handle the word of God. This is a great weapon and also a bad one too if it's used the wrong way. Or sometimes you use it in a defensive manner because you get yourself so offended and you're bent out of shape. And you take something you heard from somebody somewhere and you use this thing, right, because you got offended and you turn the scripture that you heard and you take it out of context. You see, being offended is just an unrealistic, unrealized expectation that you put upon somebody else. You put them under the law, basically, right? So it's because you thought you should have heard something this way or someone should have done something this way or they should have done this and they didn't and now you're offended. Then you use the word of God in a very harmful way to bring correction without love. 
You bring correction the total wrong way without love. I've done this myself when I was young and dumb. I would take what I thought a theology stance was. I see Jim just staring at me. I would take, (laughs) right, something that I thought was the right way, and I would use it the wrong way, and I've done it to family members of mine. Thankfully, they were way more mature than I was in the faith, right? And I've done it the wrong way, the wrong stance before, right? We cannot do that. And so doing these things, we can call what we sometimes call church hurt, right? We think we're right. We think everybody else is wrong. We have the right answer. We have the right stance. This is the way it's got to be. You're all wrong if you don't believe what I believe. And we start hurting people because of it, right? But on the other hand, hold on. But on the other hand, someone may come to you in a very loving way with the word of God in a very loving, correcting way, and you get offended. Can I tell you this word of God is very offensive to those that don't want to hear it? You see, we all want to correct somebody, and we're all like, I'm going to use the word of God, and I'm going to correct this person, and I'm going to change, you know, make them better, right? But when someone comes to us to try and correct us, we're like, "Ah, I don't think so. No. No, you're not going to come at me that way, right? I don't want to hear that. I'm good. We all have to take it. I'm not telling you to believe everything people say about you. It's not what I'm saying. But you do have to take it on board, take check of it, listen to what the Holy Spirit's talking to you about. And if someone's doing it out of love the right way, not on Facebook, right? Not on Facebook. Y'all should just delete that thing. All right, so... If they're doing it the right way, that's what we're called to do. I would much rather have someone come to me, speak love to me, speak correction into me, guide me and disciple me and bring me back in than to just let me fall away and to let me just go down a path, right? That's what we're called to do. And inside of this scripture is probably one of the most overlooked things that we can see. Everybody around Jesus at this time, and Peter was there, asked him... Should we attack? They asked him. Did they wait and listen to what he had to say? Nope. Peter said, and he just cut the ear off. He didn't even wait for Jesus to respond. How often do we ask a question? Do we ask Jesus something? Do we ask him for something? And we're like, you're you're not fast enough. You didn't respond fast enough. Like, I think this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm going to just go do this anyways. And we don't truly listen for what the Lord has for us. We don't wait for that response of what he has. In the waiting, we become impatient. When we think we're doing what he wants us to do, but we really just need to wait for his response. Some of us in here right now are dealing with some church hurt. Or right now the Lord's put on you like, man, I've probably caused some of this in my past. I've probably done some of this. No matter which one you are, the only way is forgiveness and repentance. Forgiveness and repentance will set you free. Forgiveness and repentance is how you overcome church hurt. Whether you caused it or you've been hurt. You see, when we don't or won't forgive, our spirit is constantly being fed bitterness, negativity, bad memories, And it's not going to change. It's not going to go away until you forgive. You see, it could be an ex-spouse. It could be an ex-business partner, a parent. Um, It could be a friend, an ex-best friend, whoever the case may be that caused it. It can be even yourself that is causing this pain. But it's going to be the people around you that are going to feel it and suffer from it. And it's the people that you don't want to. But that's who's going to feel it until you truly do forgive. And I'm here to tell you it does not have to be that way. God does not want you to live for that way. I told you he has plans for prosper, to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a hope. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. There is freedom in the name of Jesus. 
But forgiveness is not something that you're going to do today and today alone. It's going to be an every day, all the time thing that you have to do. Matthew 18 tells us this. This is Peter. This is before he had cut the person's ear off, well before. Peter says, he came up and said to him, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I still forgive him? Up to seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to 77 times. And this is seven times 70. And that's not 490 times or whatever that math equals. That's not what he's talking about. So don't keep a log book. That's 10, that's 11, that's 12. <laughs> It's not a log book counts. Numbers mean something in scripture. Seven is a perfect number. This truly what I believe is that heavenly forgiveness that he's talking about here. The father forgiving you always. He's forgiving you for everything you've done, everything you're doing, and everything you're going to do. Past, present, and future. That's what we're called to do. But how do we do it? How can I do that? Right? We cannot do it on our own. You can't. Just like I told you, like you cannot do everything on your own. You have to have the power of the Holy Spirit. It's putting your faith, hope, and trust into Jesus. And when you do that, there's a byproduct. And that byproduct is the fruit of the Spirit. And that fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Some of you all sang that song right now. You see, one of those things in there is patience. Patience is described as this, the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble or suffering without getting angry or upset. You want to hear the definition of forgive? To stop feeling angry or resentful towards someone for an offense, flaw, or mistake. They go hand in hand. I cannot have forgiveness without patience, and I have to have patience in order to have forgiveness. You see, forgiveness is not about right or wrong. It's not about, well, Mike, you don't understand. I just can't forgive them. They just don't. It's not about that. It's about doing what the Father has already done for you. He's already forgiven you. He's called you to forgive so you can live in freedom. You see, just as the Lord forgave the soldiers, the soldier or uh, the uh, servant slave that came, right? Just as he forgave them for coming at him to try and arrest him, in the midst of all of this that was going on, Jesus reached out and he healed his ear. In the midst of all that was going on, in the midst of everything that was troubling, all the tribulation, all the agony that he was going through. And they're coming to take him. And he still reached out and restored that man's ear. That's what we're called to do. Amen? Rise to your feet. What I want you to do right now is I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to read some scripture here. I just want you to close your eyes right now and listen to the scripture and let it fall over top of you. Love must be free of hypocrisy. Detest what is evil and cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. Listen, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never repay evil for evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all people. If possible, so far as it depends on you, be at peace with all people. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written. Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. 
But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Amen. Can the prayer team come forward?